I'm going to show the consequences of hypoglycemia to the brain. And anyone who has ever seen an FTG PET knows that the brain has a very high glucose uptake. The glucose is taken up from the blood by the astrocyte and then passed on to the neurons. And there are different molecules and glucose transported involved in this process. In hypoglycemia, there's hyperintensity and restricted diffusion in the cortex and basal ganglia. As you can see on the images of this 45-year-old male who was found comatose with a lot of restricted diffusion in the cortex and the lentiform nucleus on both sides. And after airway, breathing and circulation, you should always think, don't ever forget glucose. And unfortunately, there is a lot of experience with hypoglycemia in medicine. Um, because in the 1930s and 1940s, there was insulin shock therapy. So hypoglycemia induced by the administration of insulin in schizophrenic patients and because the higher brain centers responded more to the hypoglycemia than the lower brain centers it was thought to be an effective therapy and in the late 1950s there were more randomized controlled trials that showed that insulin was not such a good idea as a treatment for schizophrenia they were right about the sparing of the lower brain centers, such as the brainstem, cerebellum and thalamus, because the sparing of the thalamus is what discriminates hypoglycemia from hypoxic brain injury. And in this male patient with liver cirrhosis and a very low glucose level, you can see that there is bilateral hyperintensity in the basal ganglia and cortex again, with sparing of the thalami on the flare and also on the ADC. And the sparing of the thalamus is also the thing that discriminates hypoxia in neonates with an L sign from hypoglycemia in neonates with sparing of the thalamus in these two different cases. Sometimes there's also involvement of the hippocampi and this 37 year old female with diabetes uh, presented with decreased consciousness and she had um, amnesia and cognitive deficits because of her hippocampal lesions. Sometimes the patients don't wake up anymore and this is a study from stroke from the late 90s where they have schematically illustrated the location of the brain lesions in four patients with persistent vegetative state and you can see again the involvement of the basal ganglia hippocampi and cortex and interestingly there are gradients so in the caudate the lateral part is most affected and in the cortex the superficial cortical layer, so the second and the third layer, are most affected by hypoglycemia, whereas in hypoxia, the third, the fifth, and the sixth layer are affected. And these are three, this is from a tri trilogy of articles from 1985 in the Acta Neuropathologica from a Swedish group by Auer and they looked at the effects of hypoglycemia in rats to the cortex, the um, caudoputamen and the hippocampus. So they demonstrated the necrosis of the neurons in the second and third layer and they also found that it's not starving of the neurons, which leads to the necrosis in hypoglycemia, but because of the uh, low glucose, there's an increase of aspartate in the extracellular space and an increase in glutamate. And this occupies the receptors on the dendrites, mainly NMDA and MPAP, 
uh, receptors, which are excitatory. Then you get calcium influx in the neuron and cell membrane breakdown in the dendrites, which leads to the neuronal death. And in the second and third cortical layer, there's also a subgroup of glutamate neurons that have more zinc. And the zinc also plays a role in the cell death of the neurons. And there was also some theory that the parts that bordered the extracellular space, for example, in the dentate gyrus, the parts bordering the cistern were more affected than the parts that were bordering the diencephalon. And you can see on this electron microscopic image in the um, dentate of a rat, the synapses, you can see the swelling of the dendrites and the mitochondrial damage. And you can also see on this drawing with the neuron, the axon and the dendrite, that the dendrite swells first with breaks in the membrane. And then later there's also death of the cell body and valerian degeneration. Luckily, it doesn't always end that bad. This is a 62-year-old male with diabetes presenting with hypoglycemia and coma. And on day 14, when his diffusion had normalized, he was again responsive and opened his eyes. Thanks for watching. And next time we're going to look at hepatic 